Hi, this is Charles Weeks and Paul Savini with Barrister. Today we're going to talk about investing. This is our 10th presentation out of our 12-part financial literacy series. If you've missed any of our previous presentations, you can find them on YouTube under our Barrister Wealth Management channel, or you can also visit our website, barrister.net, and get more information from the website. So, uh, Paul, to kind of kick us off, tell us a little bit about investing. Yeah, right. So, you know, investing, we like to say, is sort of the glue that holds a, a financial plan together. I mean, what we're ultimately looking at with financial planning is the future, mm -hmm. where we're going, where we're headed with our money. And a big part of that is, you know, allocating savings to investments, whether it's our company retirement plan, our brokerage accounts, our IRAs. Mm -hmm. This is where these funds are going. And, and what are we doing with those funds once they hit those accounts? Yep. And it kind of all just starts with, with our risk profile, right? So we have this, this process that we go through with our clients, this investment investment process. And it, it kind of starts with the score. Right, right. right. So, you know, in, in any good investing process, this is where it should start at the individual level or even at the, at the institutional level as well. You know, ultimately what we want to know is what are, the, what are the purpose of these funds, okay? And what's the individual or the institution's ability to take risk? So the way we find that or the way you, anywhere in the marketplace and you know a proper investing plan would find that is through um, risk profiling so the first step in risk profiling at least for us is coming up with a risk score mm -hmm. okay and the way that we do a risk score is we have a questionnaire we give it to all of our clients and it's got 13 questions on it uh, we try not to ask direct questions in that questionnaire it's sort of roundabout because we don't want to ask people how do you feel about the stock market today um, do you want you to know, outpace inflation? Right. Uh, you know, everybody wants to make a lot of money on their investments. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to tease out um, feelings about investing and really uh, an individual or again an institution's ability to take risk, mm -hmm. ability to take risk, or, or and willingness to take risk. So that's the first step of the of the risk profiling process, for, yeah. at least for us. And I think what Paul mentioned is important. It's ability and willingness, right? So you might be willing to take on risk. You might tell us that you want to take on a lot of risk. You know, that's that's your willingness to. Your ability to take on risk is something a little bit different. That ties in things like your time horizon, your financial goals. If you tell me that you're a super aggressive investor and your risk profile on our questionnaire might tell us that, but you have to buy a house in three years, we're not going to tell you that you should go invest in an aggressive portfolio. Right. You have the willingness, but you just don't have the ability to take on risk. So um, that kind of uh, you know, that really determines what kind of portfolio, what kind of classification you would then fall into. Right, so we put the two together, and we could, we could probably just do the, the old Venn diagram here. So we have um, our risk, uh, our risk score, okay? And then we have our goals. Okay, and then this is going to be our risk profile. Okay, so it's the intersection of these two areas where we find our risk profile. And these you might see various classifications in the marketplace, but very common would be conservative. moderate or aggressive and then these classifications leads right into the idea of you know risk versus reward right so as kind of Paul tied all this together as an investor where you fall kind of along these classifications will will Put you in a position where you'll either have larger returns or smaller returns based on your willingness to take on risk. Uh, investing really comes down to risk versus reward, right? As, as does a lot of things in life, right? But from an investment perspective, you could tell us, oh, I want a 10% return, but I don't want any risk in my portfolio. Okay, that gets into Bernie Madoff territory, right? Like yeah. you can't have that kind of return without taking on. A, 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 that, that amount of risk within the portfolio as well. Right, and it's this is an, an extremely important point that we try to emphasize 
with our clients and everybody we meet when we talk about, in our case, our business, and particularly through the lens of what's happening in the market right now, mm -hmm. right? We see asset, certain asset classes producing tremendous returns in very short periods of time. Mm -hmm. For us, we always go back to the risk versus reward trade-off dynamic. And when we see high returns, we know by default you have high risk. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely important. We'll talk about this when we get into a, a little section here on speculation, but that's, you know, it's a good time to emphasize that. Mm -hmm. We should emphasize it a few times throughout this discussion because, uh, the, again, the market uh, today is, is, is hot, you know, in certain areas. Yeah. And when we see uh, a lot of high returns in short periods of time, for us, it's like, okay, that's great, but we should also know that what goes along with that is, is uh, risk, Absolutely. a lot of risk. And when Paul and I talk about risk versus reward, we're talking about risk as in volatility. Volatility of returns, where it's like a roller coaster. There's gonna be ups and downs. Uh, the proper way to invest, the way that we believe, limits volatility so that your portfolio will never go to zero. We're gonna talk about different investment vehicles. There are certain investment vehicles where your return can go to zero. That's not just volatility anymore. That's risk of total loss, which again, in a proper portfolio where you're building a diversified portfolio, you're gonna avoid that risk of total loss that we're right. out there. So right. that kind of gets us into portfolio construction. So right. what are some of the ways that I can invest? Okay, so let's talk first in terms of the lowest cost vehicles and that's gonna be directly investing in stocks and bonds, okay? We'll, we'll keep it simple for this discussion and um, high, at the highest level possible, you're gonna buy, you can buy stocks and bonds individually. You might attach to each as a cost, it'll be your transaction cost. Some places it's zero now, <laughs> Yeah, right? many places it's zero. Um, and bonds just have a small markup. At this bonds point. will have markups, so that's gonna be your cost there. The next level down uh, in terms of, or next level up in terms of cost, are going to be ETFs, exchange traded funds. There's a lot of different ETFs out there. This market out there, this marketplace has grown tremendously. You have factor ETFs, you have index ETFs, um, you have ETFs investing in real estate commodities, all kinds of things. But generally speaking, ETFs are attracting lower costs, lower expense ratios than um, than the next level, which is mutual funds. Then we can get into um, alternative asset class or alternative investment vehicles, private equity, venture capital, and hedge funds, hedge funds and all these things. They're out there as well. But for you know, for the purpose of this discussion, keep it high level. You've got stocks and bonds, ETFs, and mutual funds. Mutual funds attract higher expense ratios or higher fees because they 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 tend to be actively managed. Mm -hmm. So those those active managers, those teams of uh, traders, research analysts and portfolio manager, managers supporting the the activity of that fund, they they attract higher costs because there's more people involved in the process of investing. And just generally speaking, ETF fees might be 0.05% up to maybe 0.2% on average. Yeah. On average, mm -hmm. you know, depending upon the more exotic ETFs, you could get as high as 0.8%, almost 1%. Mutual funds depending upon the share class, again, we could have a whole presentation just on mutual funds, but you're looking at much higher average costs for mutual funds, maybe 1% of the year. Right, right. So once we've, once we've identified, okay, what are vehicles, then we're gonna talk about asset classes. So mm -hmm. what, what are, what's inside all of these vehicles that we have? And we would separate that by asset classes. So asset classes at the highest level, we'll just talk about um, four asset classes. We have uh, cash, so lowest risk, Okay, lowest return, pure cash. Cash, you have cash equivalents like uh, money market funds. Earning next to nothing right now. Right, earning zero right <laughs> yeah. now, right? And then the next next step up in terms of, uh, of uh, risk and reward is fixed income or bonds. Okay, so again, it's, a, it's a, any, any investment that gives you a fixed return or not quite guaranteed, but you're pretty sure you're gonna get that return. You're higher up in the, uh, the hierarchy of ownership or, or in terms of, uh, of lending to a company, uh, you're gonna get a lower return for that, but you've got more peace of mind in terms of getting, uh, getting uh, your money back. Mm -hmm. um, number three would be equities. So equities attract stocks, attract a, a generally higher returns. You're an equity owner in a company now, you share in the upside. 
but also obviously higher risk. Companies can go out of business and the equity holders of the company can, get, can be wiped out. So the stock could go in theory to zero. Yeah. If you think about the capital structure of a company, it, you know, if they're going out to raise money, if they sell bonds, right, the, the bond holders are higher up on the capital structure if the company were to file for bankruptcy. Bondholders are likely to get paid back, if, especially if it's a secured bond, secured by an asset of the company. Equity holders typically are wiped out in a bankruptcy. So again, that that's that risk reward that we've been talking about. So and it's just like if you're if you're an individual, you have a house, you hold a mortgage. Well, you can't pay the mortgage. The bank comes and takes your house. Exactly. Your your ownership then in the house gets wiped out. So mm -hmm. very similar kind of concept. Yep. And the last category we could put here, which would be a, kind of a bigger catch-all, but we'll call it alternatives. So alternatives again, like I mentioned before, are going to be your venture capital, your private equity, your um, Real, Real estate, estate. Uh, commodities, we would kind of throw everything into that as, uh, that category. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, risk reward can vary within that, but liquidity could be an issue as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of put that as uh, number four on the list. Yep. Okay. So once we've got our, we've got, you know, a concept here, a framework, right? We've got our vehicles and we have our asset classes. We could dive into even more granularity in terms of sub asset classes. So if we look at stocks, and I'll just touch on this briefly. If we look at stocks, for instance, within stocks, we could talk about uh, U.S. domestic stocks. We could talk about international stocks, European stocks, Asia Pacific. You can go regional. You can talk about large cap, small cap. You've got growth and value. You've got blend. There's all kinds of ways to slice and dice the stock market. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the but the point is to say that when we we've kind of got our 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 vehicles and our asset classes, we're going to now talk about building a portfolio, okay? And the, the idea behind portfolio construction would be one, diversification, and two, matching our risk profile. So if we have an aggressive risk profile, we're going to build a portfolio with more stocks than bonds and cash, because the stocks are going to, in theory, give us a higher return over a long, over a long horizon than the bonds and cash would. So this is where you get into, you hear about 60-40 portfolios, for example. This is, this is portfolio construction with, with our vehicles and our, and our asset classes. And, and just to Paul's point, just when you build that portfolio now, it gets back again into risk reward, which we'll keep revisiting. In this more aggressive portfolio, I'm gonna have more equities, more stocks than I am bonds and cash. More possible reward but definitely more volatility. Right. There's going to be so, more risk in the portfolio. Yeah. For instance, when we 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 have a portfolio back test for our aggressive, I can I, our aggressive model portfolio. I can you know say it off the top of my head because I've seen it so many times. You know the, the the peak to trough drawdown in that portfolio, which was the 2008 2009 period, was 42 percent. So if you had a hundred thousand dollars going a portfolio of a hundred thousand dollars going into that period, at one point in time, you saw forty two thousand dollar drawdown on that portfolio right and that's the risk of holding you know an aggressive portfolio you know from the from the rearward lens right going forward we don't know where things will go but you know the rear, rearward looking lens of that portfolio is you know you've got a large drawdown there can you stomach that yeah because if can you, you can and i don't know the exact number but we ran we run these back tests from like 1986 to the present What's the average return on the investment? It's over 9%. Yeah. yeah. So again, it's the ability to stomach the volatility to get through that kind of drawdown, like Paul mentioned, to get that kind of return. Yeah. You know? So it's, it's, it, it all plays a part. You know? right. Yeah, ultimately the risk is really you. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what is your reaction to seeing your portfolio uh, fall in value like that, yeah. right? And, um, yeah. And then it just, that gets into diversification versus speculation, right? right. So the way that we, we invest, we diversify, what's it mean to speculate versus? Speculation is, okay, if we take an index ETF, let's say the Russell 1000, it's the thousand largest stocks traded in the United States, thousand largest companies uh, in the United States. That's a highly diversified portfolio, a thousand companies. That, port, that uh, ETF or mutual fund or whatever is investing in that index will not go to zero. Right, I mean, we, we, you know, it would take an extraordinary scenario that we've not seen throughout history for that portfolio to go to zero. I make the bad joke that if something like that goes to zero, we would be fighting each other, you know, in the streets over toilet paper at that point. Like the financial system, the world as we know it, would literally have to collapse for something like that to right. go to zero. Right. So the inverse of that, which we call speculation, is picking one stock from that portfolio. Well, 
Take, take a hot stock of today, Tesla. You know, Tesla's created tremendous returns for investors, right? But Tesla stock, in theory, and we talk, remember we said the inverse relationship between risk and reward, if you've got this, or the you know, direct causation between risk and reward, if you have high returns, like we've seen with a, a stock like Tesla, you can also see high drawdowns, high risk attached to those returns. So, you know, in theory, uh, you know, we've seen it, look back throughout history, recent history, WorldCom, um, Enron. Enron, you know, uh, Tyco, you've had uh, corporate scandals, you've had fraud, you've had all kinds of things happen to bring companies down and to basically wipe out their equity holders. Bad business decisions. Yeah. Blackberry, right? Baron, who happened to iPhone killed Blackberry. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Kodak, you know, they didn't believe in digital cameras. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's, there's all these, like, you know, the stories in history where these companies have gone bankrupt. So having all of your money, having your portfolio allocated to a single stock or even a small group of stocks or even a concentrated sector of stocks, I'm all on technology and it's been great, you know, that's that's good for returns. It can be good for returns at times, but it can also be really bad for returns yeah. at other times. People love to tell stories about, oh, well, I know this person. I know this guy, I know this girl, they made a ton of money on Apple. They made a ton of money on Amazon. The, you look back and you back test historically, if you were to invest 10,000 in Amazon, you'd be a multimillionaire today. There's some great statistic out there, I don't know if it's two or three times, Amazon stock, uh, the max drawdown was greater than 90%. So Paul mentioned on that aggressive portfolio in one year, the drawdown was 42%. That was unlike any year we've ever had before. Drawdowns in a diversified portfolio are never that large, right? historically speaking anyway. But in individual stocks, that's a very normal, that's a very normal occurrence. And in really high growth stocks like Amazon, greater than 90% drawdowns happen. So could you have lived through three greater than 90% drawdowns to get that kind of return that Amazon gave you over 20 years? I would say most people couldn't. Yeah, you know? and, 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 and again, the, the, the other side of that is look at a, a, an individual like a Jeff Bezos. Like he's built his tremendous wealth because he was able, he didn't really have a choice. You know, he lived through those periods, he experienced those drawdowns. But can the, can the individual investor, the institutional investor that sees that happening in their portfolio, if it's a large portion of their portfolio, can they, do they really, do they really believe, you know, in those companies at that time? Uh, to, to, to continue to take that yeah. risk, it's uh, you know it's a, it's an open question, and it's such a um, it, it's such a rare occurrence to get a company like Amazon. There's a the majority of companies out there never perform that way. Right. So it's not even just about do you have the gut to hang on, are you hanging on to the right company? Yeah, that gets into a whole bunch of behavioral stuff that we'll talk about in, in a minute. But that's the other side of it, um, and I, I just think kind of the the idea of single stock positions or really single any asset class position can make you very rich or very poor, right? Yeah. I mean, you could lose everything, or if you you kind of, you find that one diamond, it could make you very, very wealthy, but you have to look at the downside too. You have to always look at the risk right. of these things. And that's what we, we call it <laughs> speculation, you know, relative to investing, which is more of a process and systematic. And again, we'll get into that around the discussion uh, at the end with behavioral. Yeah. So the next, the next uh, so we've, we've kind of got a framework now for, um, assessing our ability to take risk, um, the vehicles we're going to use, and then the asset classes we're going to assign percentages of our portfolio to. The last step is ongoing maintenance. So there's two things we're gonna talk about there. Yeah. Right? So uh, first one is rebalancing. So Paul mentioned just again, 60-40 portfolio, moderate, 60% in stocks, 40% in bonds. As one asset class outperforms, naturally that's gonna become a larger percentage of your portfolio. So we want to rebalance once we go a little bit too far outside our target range. If you were just to invest in a 60-40 portfolio and let it run for 10 years, eventually you might end up with an 80-20 portfolio, meaning it's going to be more aggressive uh, you know, and more volatile. And then if there's a drawdown, you might be more likely to sell out and never get back into the market, you know, um, which is really detrimental to your overall long-term returns. So we typically rebalance the portfolio annually or as needed. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing is taxes. So you know, what, kind of, what can I do with taxes, from, especially you know, we, we got the extension, tax time till May, but a little too late to do some tax loss selling, but what can we do in our portfolios for taxes? Well, we can, we can monitor the positions in our portfolio during times of stress. Mm -hmm. Like the best recent example was last March. Uh, the market had a very sharp, very fast drawdown, 20, 30%. There were individual positions, particularly in portfolios that we managed, where we were able to liquidate those holdings to crystallize losses for certain investors. 
And those losses, we can then offset gains uh, throughout the year in the portfolio, or if there's, if there's no other recognized gains, you know, the IRS gives us $3,000 a year. It's not, it's not huge, but it's something that we can use uh, to offset income. Mm -hmm. So capital losses in our portfolios, we can use to offset income. Now these are, by the way, these are taxable portfolios. These are not your 401ks, your IRAs. Mm -hmm. These are just taxable investments mm -hmm. that we're reporting at, we're getting a 1099 for them. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's uh, called tax loss harvesting. It's, it's something that any good uh, portfolio manager is looking for periodically. And again, it's, it's gonna tend to happen during times of stress uh, on the market or if a particular company is having issues. Yeah. And as Paul mentioned, you, you, you crystallize those losses, you sell, but then you also invest in a similar, but not exactly like type of investment so that you still get that exposure in the market when the market returns, but you've locked in that loss on that other asset. Right. So. Um, it's really, really important, and, and there, there's a lot of return that's generated from rebalancing and then proper kind of tax management within a portfolio. Yeah, I think you know the last point to make around those two points is we, we, we do come across, uh, you know, uh, prospective uh, investors and people come across in, the, in in our in our business these days who are you know th these are two aspects of ongoing active portfolio management that that get a little bit of maybe short shrift from mm -hmm. the market these days because everyone's experiencing tremendous growth. And, uh, and they don't really necessarily pay attention to these things, but it's extremely important, mm -hmm. those, those two uh, ongoing management uh, uh, activities that, uh, again, any, any good portfolio manager or money manager, whatever you wanna call them, is, is doing yeah, for you. Absolutely. So the last thing we're gonna talk about is behavioral. Uh, this is a subject that I love. I just find it super interesting. Paul and I talk about it all the time. We are not wired to properly manage money or invest money. People are just not wired that way. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about some of the, the biases and, and, and Paul jump in on some of them. Um, the first one is just confirmation bias, right? So uh, we choose to listen or read those things that we believe in. So if you are, uh, if you lean right politically, you're probably watching Fox News. If you lean left, you're probably watching CNN or MSNBC. That's normal, right? It's, it's what you believe in, it's confirmation bias. If you think that Google's a great investment or maybe you believe in Bitcoin these days or NFTs or some of the other things going on, you are more likely to read people writing positive reviews or research stories about how you feel about a certain subject. It's natural, it's just behavioral in nature. The other one is loss aversion. So you know, Paul, how many people do we have come to us where they have these losses in their portfolios, right, that they've held on to forever? Loss aversion is you are unwilling to sell an investment because for you to do that, you'd have to admit you're wrong. And you just, that's a difficult thing to do. Everyone, you know, we wanna feel smart, we wanna feel like we're doing the right thing. And we hold on to these, you know, investments, you know, and just and hope they come back at some point. The other one is uh, disposition effect, which uh, similar to loss aversion, except this impacts people by selling winners and not even allowing those winners to run. So, if you are, uh, I mean, we deal this with the clients. Uh, clients will tell us, you know, once we hit that certain number in our portfolio, we're going to sell. We want to, you know, rebalance, get more conservative. We're going to sell. Paul and I will tell them, no, it all comes back to your your plan, your risk tolerance. We need to managers we need to hold on most people never get the kind of returns they could get from their portfolios because they're selling and not letting those winners run again it should be part of a construction uh, it should be part of the we actually didn't even cover investment policy statements but that's something that we recommend where we kind of pull all this together for our clients and, and kind of go through all this with them but that has a big impact on returns uh, hindsight bias everyone feels like because they've been through a certain crisis or experience Looking back on it, they know how they're going to handle the next crisis and experience. And so we've had people say, oh, well, you know, I know what this feels like. I know, looking back on 08, I, I knew real estate was overvalued. Mm -hmm. They didn't do anything about it, but they knew it was overvalued at the time. Or, you know, going through this pandemic that we've, we've been going through, we've talked to a lot of clients and said, you know, this crisis, uh, we, we understand it now. Looking back on things, if there's ever a crisis like this in the future, we know how we're going to react. We don't, right? Everyone kind of feels different, but in our minds, we think we're gonna be able to, to act the same way. Um, a big one is recency bias. Uh, that, that's another big behavioral um, uh, behavioral issue that we have, and that gets into trends. So what are some of the trends that people you know, have that been chasing now? They'll look back and say, what did the best last year? We have this great um, tool that we use with clients. It's a periodic uh, table of returns. And it shows like, okay, back in 2008, this is what did the best, this is what did the worst. Or 2008, like long-term treasuries did the best. 
And of course they did because what was going on in the markets, we had these massive drawdowns. Treasuries are kind of the risk-free type of investment. Well, and, 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 and I think just to jump in there, one of the things I love about that table is the top, the, the, the difference between whatever comes up at the top and at the bottom, which perfectly illustrates the trade-off between risk and reward, mm -hmm. right? Because you've got uh, top returning in one year is the bottom in another year, two or three years later. And it, you know, the, the shifting of those things from top to bottom and that volatility of what asset classes, what um, subgroups, whatever you're, however you're slicing and dicing the market, those returns, uh, whether they appear at the top or the bottom, it's really fascinating. Yeah. And it just perfectly illustrates, you know, just what we're talking about yeah. in terms of risk. And, and, and ask yourself this, have you ever looked at your 401k and looked at last year's returns and then based your investment allocation on what happened last year? If you have, that's recency bias. You're looking at, it's chasing trends. You're saying, okay, well this, this, you know, for lack of a better example, just say a Russia, you know, mutual fund. I, I remember seeing, the reason I bring this up, I remember literally seeing a client that had a Russia focused mutual fund inside their 401k and it was up like 70% the prior year and they wanted to put 100% of their 401k in it. And we, we went through this whole process, obviously they didn't do that, and I think that was down 50% the following year. It's just what happens, right? The best performers end up being the, the worst performers. Um, and the last thing I'll just talk about is generally speaking, fear and greed. Uh, when the markets, uh, when there's fear in the markets, when people are scared, that's when we should want to be greedy and we should allocate more to stocks. When there's greed in the market and everyone thinks that things are just gonna keep going up and things are gonna be great, that's when we should be fearful and we should try to pare back a little bit, you know, our equity exposure. We are not wired that way. Yeah, and by the way, rebalancing. Guess what rebalancing does? Well, we, we talk about the example of if equities double in value, what does rebalancing do? You are cutting those equities that have appreciated value from your portfolio. It's part of a systemic portfolio management planning process around investing. Yeah, and just to get, get the fear and greed example one more time, if there's a sale at your favorite store, right? Yeah, so uh, Macy's is having a 50% off sale. That should draw you in to go buy clothes. Everything's on sale. If Macy's came out tomorrow and said, we're marking up everything 50%, are you gonna come to my store and buy my clothes? No, that's exactly what people do in the stock market. The, the stock market's up 50%, you decide that you're gonna take your entire 401k and put it all on stocks. You are deciding to go shop at Macy's at a 50% markup day. It is just totally the opposite of what we should be doing, but we're wired that way, and also the media doesn't help. You don't hear about the stock market on your local ABC News or CBS News unless the market is up 1,000 points one day or unless it's down 1,000 points one day. It's the fear and greed, and, and we have to manage those behaviors. If we don't, we're never gonna get the kind of returns that the market can give us. Yeah, and, and ultimately, you know, we've, we've cataloged, cataloged a number of different behavioral issues that people have with investing. And hopefully what it illustrates is, you know, there's just no better way to invest than to have someone do it for you. And this is not a plug for us. It's just a, a general recognition of the challenges that we all have managing our own money, mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to investing. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and if we uh, work with a professional who has a good system and a process uh, we're putting ourselves light years ahead of most people who are just trying to do it themselves. And it's just, it's something we see a lot. We come across it a lot. It's, it's really hard for us to admit these things, mm -hmm. but you know, we could get into a much longer, deeper discussion in any one of those behavioral areas. But um, suffice to say that the, the body of that should illustrate that you know, this, this is the right way to, to uh, manage your money. It's really with letting someone else do it for you. Absolutely. And just kind of tie it all together, Paul. What, so where does investing fall into everything we've been talking about? So well, yeah, like I said at the beginning, it's, it is ultimately the glue that holds our plan together because the reality of life is, is inflation. We can see it now in home prices in particular. Food. If you're trying, food, if you're fuel, mm -hmm. if you're trying to do anything uh, in your house, you know, you want to get a plumber out or an electrician out. Or lumber, right? Lumber <laughs> prices. So the inflation is real, yeah. particularly today. Um, so if we don't have investment returns dri driving some of our asset values up, we're going to fail to achieve you know, goals that we set out for us in the future. You know, the most common one, common one being retirement. So in, in, investing is hugely important. And, um, and how, do we, how do we use it within a plan? 
Well, we alluded to this earlier. We, we back test our portfolios, okay? The conservative, the moderate, the aggressive returns. And you could see, you know, these could be sliced, these could be, you know, you could see five or seven or, you know, different ways of showing these. But the bottom line is what we should see is some kind of expected rate of return attached to each. And that is the rate of return that we're going to build in to our financial plan. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about, will I have enough money to retire? Think about how that then falls back on, if I have a speculative portfolio, can I really project returns on a speculative portfolio? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Do I then have the confidence to say, okay, in 20 years when I'm ready to retire, I feel good that my portfolio values will be around this level, which will be enough for me, for me to achieve the goal of retirement. So the whole thing ties together. And if it's, if it's a, a systematic process like we've illustrated, you know, you're, you're way ahead of the game in terms of feeling confident and comfortable with your overall financial plan. Yep, absolutely. And Paul touched on inflation and just, uh, I'll touch, just cover real quick something about that. We meet a lot of people that feel comfortable sitting on large sums of cash. That, if you think about what your actual real return is on that cash, you might be earning 0.01% in the bank right now. But as Paul mentioned, inflation's a real, it's a real issue. Inflation means that you, the, the, the cost of the things you're purchasing could be increasing 3% every year. So you actually have a negative real return on your money. Unless you're Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg or some of these people, you can't live with a negative real return over your lifetime. Inflation is slowly destroying the wealth that you have. So you have to invest in some way Conservative portfolio, moderate, aggressive, wherever your risk tolerance, your willingness and ability allow you to invest, you gotta invest somewhere to outpace inflation in some way. So. All, right. All right, well guys, that's it. Thank you very much. We have two more presentations left, so stay tuned for them. Take care.